everyone, and welcome to the NBS Show Reviews. I am James Cork, and with me I have Norman Sanso. Hello, hello, and a good day to you all. And awesome pony reviewer, Silver Quill. Me, I'm not Bizarro Silver. <laughs> oh no, it's Alternate Universe Silver. He hates every single episode out there. <laughs> no. Oh, no! Actually, uh, I'm just ambivalent. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Objectivism to the max. Oh dear. This is the My universe universal re- response is meh. <laughs> the universe written by Ayn Rand. We're all screwed. Oh no. <laughs> dear me. And today we are going to be reviewing. Oh my god. Probably the biggest story arc out there for the MLP comics that is the Reflections arc uh, written by. Uh, Katie Cook and drawn by Andy Price. As always, this tandem hasn't been together doing a a long story arc since the Queen Chrysalis one, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last one was only two issues long. Now we're going back to the four issues arc. That's so... It, it, it feels like it has a change of, of pace. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. it's kind of normal because you kind of have the two arc story where... They have like, okay, here's something cool, something exciting, nothing too serious. And when Katie Cook and the Price work together on a full story arc, everybody kind of gets hyped. Yeah, because they're kind of like, you know, they are like the M.A. Larson, Megan McCarthy team of the group, I think, of mm-hmm. the comic. Because it's like every time that they make a new co- a new comic, is like whenever they they release a new episode, it's like oh, we have to keep this one scrutinized. <laughs> let's let's look at this with a magnifying glass. Let's see what we can find in it. Oh, you. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not like I am making foreshadowing for what we're going to say in this review. Anyway, the storyline for this one, the synopsis, is very simple and at the same time. Very complicated as well. So what I am going to do, this one is a special case. I'm going to give a very bare bones outline of it. And the rest of it, we're going to explain it in the review. Because there are spoilers pretty much from page 5 of the comic. Oh my. So, okay. The storyline for this one is Princess Celestia disappears through a mirror. Very similar to the one that we saw in Equestria Girls. And Luna has to call the elements of harmony, that is the main six. And Spike, let's not forget about Spike to investigate this uh, event. And in order to do that, they have to go through the writings of Starshield the Bearded. And that's as far as I can read. Everything else uh, uh, from this point onwards is a massive spoiler. And I think there is no better way to discuss this than actually talking about it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think it's time to start reviewing this one. So we should start with general opinions and then get down to what the comic is about and all that. All right. What do you guys think? I agree. Well, that was easy. (laughs) (laughs) He thinks he agrees. Yay. This comic has caused such a stir uh, amongst fans. I mean, this was the, the backlash from this was immense. And really, I think I can point to one thing that really, uh, that really upset everyone, but I'll, I think we'll get to that in due course. For me, this comic is filled with so many good ideas and so many things I'd actually love to see in the show. But the problem is that it's so full, nothing gets a proper fleshing out. And so by the end, you almost feel like it's incomplete. I think the biggest problem is that it suffers a preponderance of flashbacks. Hmm. I'd say more than half the comic is flashbacks. Maybe even more than half. Okay. I, I don't know. In, in my opinion, I kind of like the comic in as, as it is because it touches upon one of the least developed characters in the show, which is Celestia. And knowing her backstory, knowing her life as it is, and what she wants but really can't get it, is kind of sad yet awesome at the same time i really enjoy this one it is the moral of this comic celestia can't have nice things uh-huh. <laughs> yep yep that's that's the thing and when you look at it that way and you really think about it it's sad it's really sad this comic has uh i agree with what you guys say by the way completely but mm-hmm. the biggest problem in this comic i think uh <laughs> It, it, it is a massive problem, and it's a huge problem. It's not a deal-breaker for me, though, but 
the problem is that it bites off more than it can chew. It tries to uh, it tries to embrace a lot of things. Like like Silver said, it has a lot a lot of ideas, and none of them is bad. This is probably one of those comics where one of those stories where you look at and you say everything is in its right place. Mm -hmm. Everything is good. You have the alternate universes. You have the alternate interpretations of characters. You have uh, different takes on different situations and different events. Um, you you have a lot of character development for characters that don't have any business being fleshed out. Like Celestia, Celestia from the very beginning, she has been a plot ploy. A, 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 yeah. A plot ploy, like she's only there to deliver them, to help deliver the moral, and to uh, yes, to be an anchor to Twilight whenever things go bad. There is no reason for her to be in the story, what's in in the show whatsoever, except for those reasons. And in here, she actually has a reason uh, uh, to be. In that she, we see her being naive, we see her being um, uh, uh, reckless and careless, and then when she's older regretting those actions. Mm -hmm. Even though she apparently is continuing to be reckless and careless. Well, here's the thing. It's Which is something love. that she carries from that. Yeah, well, it, yeah, but it, it, it is true. She is still reckless and careless to throw her um, her student into that situation. Well, that's kind of the formula. Thing goes wrong. Twilight, could you help me on this? Yay, here's a gold star. Actually, I'm thinking more of the first issue, page one, uh, two, actually. Mm-hmm. Page two, she goes into the mirror. She, oh. She's still doing the crossover higgly jiggly. Oh, you're talking about this one then. All right. um, yeah. No, but still, it's like, like I said. No, that is true. That mm -hmm. is true. But then again, that happens because, you know, if you have been decades, centuries, mm -hmm. trying to get to do something, uh, there are some things in the, in the world, that, some emotions that are going to completely blind you, uh, even from your logic. True that, like true sometimes, that. sometimes passion and feelings they have no logic, and I think this is this is the main theme with the comic is that uh, if you try to apply logic to anything that happens here, when it's something that is moved for other reasons, for other means, uh, you are not going to you are not going to get a satisfactory resolution, mm -hmm. and that's in the end that's what happens. <laughs> you know, for this comic, it's about Celestia's love with this that other world's king sombra and it's really touching and the way that they told it was really awesome and the conclusion to that love story is really sad much better than twilight the book sparkle is doing just fine <laughs> yeah 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 Yeah, twilight is doing fine i Although, mean even with well look at flash century we have to yeah. keep an eye on that guy yeah yeah no, uh. but but overall um <laughs> uh, but so, uh, your groan or or of despair, Silver, sounds so contained and at the same time so angry. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm thinking of well, I just did a video on Flash Century not long ago, oh, and yeah. all the drama surrounding him. But that, that's actually also part of why fans reacted so strongly to this comic, mm -hmm. not Flash Century. But suddenly, Celestia has a boyfriend, cold friend, whatever. Uh, how and dare people, how dare they? Mm -hmm. yeah, people get in an uproar on this really quickly. You, you know, here's the thing. You guys say drama, this and that, about, oh, this and that. And to me, I didn't hear anything at all about oh, I this. Did. Like, it, it could be that I was oblivious to this, or it's just that I couldn't care. But to me, it's... You this... know what? I will tell you, Norman, I stood away from the drama, and even I caught some tale of the drama, and I it didn't. was revolting. It was disgusting. I, I didn't. That what people were saying, they were defending the honor of Celestia like she was actually, a re first of all, like she was a real character, <laughs> mm -hmm. and second, like she had no right to have a love interest. No, I, I, I do not agree. Here's the thing. What makes a character interesting is their flaws. Look at us. I don't speak real good English. James is Spanish, and Silver Quill is... <laughs> is that a flaw? <laughs> That's not a word. Oh my god, Norman. I'm going to have to talk with you after the show's over. Oh, Twilight has been manipulating me. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to go hide, hide over here. Yeah, but see, every one of us has flaws. Like, I make bad jokes. That's one of the flaws that I do. Oh but god. that's what makes us interesting. Oh unbearable depending on who you're talking to but that's you're unbearable now <laughs> but that was makes it interesting and fun just no, to... I, okay okay go for it go yeah, for it that's what makes it interesting just to know how we 
act and how we are and also how we develop as time goes on. Like one of my favorite things to look at or see is the two best friends play because in the very beginning we have just Matt and Pat. They do videos and now we have Wooly and Liam. They add in to the flavor of the whole formula and now we see that how their character develops and so on. I enjoy that. And with this, we have Celestia getting a character development, which is good. I like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Same here. I I wanted character development for Celestia from pretty much the first season. Mm-hmm. And like you say, we love these characters because we kind of identify with their quirks and flaws as much as their strengths. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Celestia has been presented as a mother figure mm-hmm. and perfect in many respects, which reminds me of when the Cantalot Wedding came out, so many people cry foul that Celestia didn't apologize to Twilight. Oh, God. The whole Damn. cab. The whole cast did not believe Twilight, but everyone harped on Celestia for not apologizing. You know, I harped on. I harped on everyone. We're not going to talk about the Canterlot Wedding. Mm-hmm. I can spend an entire day talking about the first episode of a Canterlot Wedding and saying oh how it betrays every single value that the show has been working up, working up to until that point. But I was harping on everybody, every one of the main six. But when Celestia said said that. That really got me angry. It was like, oh, come on. Now you're just, you're not acting like a character. You're acting because the screenplay is telling you to do that. (laughs) Yeah, but it it doesn't feel natural. It feels like, it it feels contrived and forced. Yeah, I mean, that's another story for another day, even if we touch on that. Which it cannot apply to this one. True that, true that. But yeah, besides that, uh, we got a comic to review, right? I'm talking about the comic now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. if you realize, guys, we haven't said if we like the comic or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we jumped into reviewing it uh, right away. So uh, I, I vote for going uh, alphabetically reversed. So start with silver and finish on me. All right. So All right. Yeah, we, we should talk about what we think, of what if we like the comic or not. And then we should start talking about what we like and what we don't like. All right. In my opinion. This is a very big comic. So uh, by all, by all means, silver... The stage is all yours. Oh, this is my stage now. Yep. Yes. A little, little Japanese humor for, or quote for anyone who knows. <laughs> but uh, how, how to describe this? I like so many of the elements and the ideas within this comic, but the overall package comes off as disappointing. Hmm. That at the at the very end, I feel like it fumbles. Mostly because the com and I'll go into depth on this when we're doing likes and dislikes, but the comic breaks its own rules, and uh, and it feels like it doesn't. It, it brings stuff up and then never touches it, so it feels incomplete. Mm-hmm. So I guess my view is kind of neutral, but leaning towards an overall negative. And what about you, Norman? Well, I really enjoyed this comic. Reading through it again, I was... How how would I put this? I know what happened. I know the story. But me reading through it again, it made me feel... I won't say sympathy. It made me feel for Celestia and how she is. Like, knowing who she is and knowing what the character is in the grand scheme of things, like... Like I said before, it's a love story. And knowing that a uh, immortal, I'm guessing she's immortal because she lives for over a thousand years, so on. And knowing that she can't find love or knowing that the love of her life is in another parallel dimension, it's sad that they can't be together. And the end, I'm not going to reveal it until we go to it. But overall, I do like this one. Um, the story's Okay, the writing's nice. I won't say nice. Nice is a bad word. Um, the writing yeah, is it is so nice. Good. <laughs> the, you're, you're going. You're going Fluttershy's. They're nice. <laughs> yeah, nice. No, but but seriously, <laughs> it's good. The writing is good. The art is good. The coloring by Heather Breckle is also good. I mean, I there's nothing I can say bad about it. I mean, you guys mentioned that there's some kind of drama online about people not. The people saying that, how dare you write this? Learn your 
learn how to write my Celestia in this fanfic. <laughs> learn how to write for horses. Oh my god, you're so bad. Yeah. No, but still, I don't see it. And one thing I like about Andy Price's art, or I got no idea if Heather Breckle had a sorry. I don't. I have no idea if Katie Cook have a hand in this, but I do like the references that they put inside here. Mousetrap, Monopoly. What does it do? do? A few other things like the sixties yeah, Batman. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I do like it, and it goes on and on. If you look at the cover, do take a look. See at the mirror. You see Rainbow Dash's reflection, which is a meaner version of it, and Pinkie Pie is the Pinkamina Diana Pie. So I do like the little touches by them. And overall, I say this is a good book. I have no complaints. Five out of five, I would say. But reviews, <laughs> as, um, rating aside, James, what about you? Norman has been very worried about me saying anything about this comic. He's been going about it, and uh, I actually have been debating it with myself. And when when I was reading the comic, I was, I I was. It was very much like uh, almost everybody was like, I really want to like you, but you don't let me. I really want to get into Celestia's and Sombra's love, but I can't. I really want to get into this alternate universe thingy, but I cannot get into it. I'm trying, I'm trying so hard. And then the last issue um, uh, got released. And that ending, uh, uh, we arrive at that ending. And then I realized what I think uh, they were going for, and or what I what I am what I am getting from this comic is that uh, this is a comic entirely driven by emotion. This is a comic entirely driven by feels. In that uh, it's all about the relationship between uh, the impossible relationship between Celestia and the alternate universe uh, Sombra, and how every single other character around it suffers because of it. Uh, it's Definitely, the, yeah, it is enti- almost entirely told in uh, flashback because it's supposed to build up this. But then when they give you that payoff, that uh, uh, that conclusion at the end of the comic, those last three pages, uh, that was a massive slap in the face uh, to everyone who bought into the, the romance and everyone who cared about the characters and everyone who, who liked these characters. And when I first read it, I, 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 I have to admit, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. I was like, oh, god damn it! Why did they have to end it like this? What a disappointment of an arc! This is this this just it sucks. Is you know what? It's it feels like a very bad day in my life. And that's when it clicked, when I said, it feels like real life. This comic feels like real life. It's all a, it's all a series of events that don't work properly. That people suffer around it because of it. That you look back wondering if there was a way for you to uh, make them better, and that it doesn't have a happy ending and it doesn't explain everything. Real life is like that. To me, this is probably the most uh, mature, the most adult of all the comic arcs because it doesn't have a happy ending. It doesn't have a finite conclusion, and it doesn't give you all of the answers. It leaves a lot of things hanging, intentionally so, because that's not the focus of the story. To me, when when I saw it from that perspective, I thought, this this arc is brilliant. And it actually has become one of my favorite arcs out there, along with the, um, the pirate arc and the big Macintosh mm-hmm. uh, arc, as... Like, the Big Macintosh arc was very funny, very uh, hilarious and full of comedy. The pirate arc was straight up adventure and fun and fantasy. This one I like it because it doesn't down-talk to the target audience. It treats the reader... Uh, it, it, not, uh, not so much the grown-ups, because we like to uh, find the explanation for everything. But the children, it gives them a very important lesson that in life, when you're a grown-up, you're not going to get the answers for everything. And... That is one thing that I do take from this comic uh, comic arc in, arc in particular. I think it's great. I really, really like this arc, but I can totally understand why so many other people didn't like it and why so many other people had uh, a negative opinion on it. Because it's difficult to get into it. It is really difficult to get into it. Well, that's surprising. 
Cool. You thought I was going to hate it. You did at first. Yeah, you thought I was going to give it a negative review. <laughs> oh, you troll. I'm waiting for Silver to give any feedback about this. I hope I didn't angry, anger anyone. I get an anger. How dare you like something I'm neutral about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 but, uh, but I'm just I'm sort of pondering because this is done in flashbacks so much. Would it be easier to tackle Celestia and Sombra as a whole and then move on to the present conflict? So to speak? I, I don't think so because. The way that this story is told, it's supposed to be told in flashbacks because if they concentrate so much on one issue being a flashback story about how Star Swirl and Celestia jump through worlds just to go and discover new things and just to explain about how how Equestria was made, it would be, I don't know, for this arc, a bit sidetracking to what they really want to tell. We do see them going through the portal just discovering things about other things like science and fashion and other things that's available in other places. So And Fluttershy is related to a T-Rex. Oh, yeah, true that. No wonder... They... That is the one thing that still makes me scratch my head about. It's like, what? So what, how many dinosaurs have cutie marks too? Well, what? you have to remember, this is a parallel universe, so there's going to be a pterodactyl rainbow dash, probably. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about this. No, don't know. I think we know why she's so fiery all of a sudden. It's because she, was, she has a T-Rex genes in her gene pool. <laughs> probably. No, but still, but still. It's one of those things that this comic is trying to tell... Things in flashbacks, like, uh, I forgot a good movie example for it. No, that's fine. There is a movie that it basically works like that. It's called uh, Cloud Atlas. It's about, it, it's not just told about fl in flashbacks, it's told about f in flashbacks, flash forwards, and then sometimes even an alternate universe that doesn't even exist. It's just uh, absolutely crazy. This comic has a similar structure to that movie in that they explain to you what a character was doing and then they show you the, the consequences. I guess telling a story in flashback is very tempting and it's very juicy because it's like, ooh, flashback. We can get some character into it. Um, but it's very problematic when your character, it's the one character that everybody knows Everybody knows who Princess Celestia is. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. know who Princess Celestia is and what she does. What do we know her? What do we know about her as a character? What can we talk about Princess Celestia as a character just from the show itself? Mm -hmm. Not a lot, guys. Um, Not a lot. I remember the movie. I remember the movie. Pulp Fiction. Oh, Pulp Fiction. Well, Pulp Fiction doesn't have a three-arc structure. It's just, it, it, it mixes things up and then... It gives you the pieces of the puzzle for you to put together in your head. Yeah, but now think about it this way. Um, the format of Pulp Fiction is they don't tell the... The story arc is not a one straight line story arc. It's like you start off in chapter three and then you go to chapter one and so on. It's all over the place. What if we look at this comic in the sense of, okay, we put this one in here, put this one in here and arrange everything in a neat, tidy line. That probably, I don't know, it makes things better, worse, who knows. But have you noticed that we haven't actually started reviewing the comic yet? We are almost skirting the issue because it's it's so back and forth that it's hard to really get into it sequentially. It's like a Christopher Nolan movie. <laughs> This comic is very much like a Christopher Nolan movie. Before you actually start talking about a Christopher Nolan film, you have to start talking about the possibility of the things happening in a Christopher Nolan film. Like, I literally had a three-day-long conversation with a couple of my friends just talking about Inception wow. and talking about what the possibilities of dreams are and if it's possible to have some, a, a dream within another dream and then within another dream or, like, uh, how will the gravity affect your perception of a dream and if it actually will make you fly or whatever, it is very much like that. <laughs> this comic is that complicated that we haven't actually started talking about the plot or what happens in it. Okay. Uh, let's. You know what? Um, no matter what we say, the comic is out and done and I like it. And Silver, what about you? You're well, as I say, I'm, I'm indifferent? kind of ambivalent but mm. still very critical of the ending. Mm -hmm. And James, so you? No, I do love this comic, and I like the the fact that the ending is 
Um, I, I like the ending. For a change, I like the ending because it doesn't give you everything. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's why the comic was perceived with such amount of criticism, not because of the Celestia being my wife. Who oh, you don't touch her, she's mine. Oh, or, no. oh you cannot give her a boyfriend. I think the the fact that people were so pissed off at the comic, it's because it didn't give them answers. In this culture where everything has to be explained, everything has to be reasoned, everything has to... Why is this happening? Why is this going on? Something dares to not give us the answer to something else, we get upset and we get mad. I sometimes like the fact that we don't get the answers of everything. It's like, oh, you want the answer to everything? Okay, how about we figure out if the top... Uh, falls or doesn't fall at the end of Inception? <laughs> or what if we find out what was inside the suitcase of Pulp Fiction? Oh, I know. How about we figure out if Harrison Ford was a replicant at the end of Blade Runner? <laughs> or what about what Bill Murray was whispering to Scarlett Johansson in Lost in Translation? <laughs> How about we, 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 we give answer to all of these mysteries? That way, life will be really goddamn boring! Because there will be no mysteries to solve and there will be answers to everything. That's life, not having the answer to something. Mm -hmm. And for once, I like the fact that there is no clear-cut answer to some of the things that happen in this comic. Mostly because it's not the focus. Actually, the focus is basically none. Mm -hmm. They go to this universe, they try to save Sombra, and they don't save him. It, it, they actually it make, the, they make the situation worse for him. <laughs> yeah. it, they, turn him into, uh they turn him into a monster. <laughs> How dare they? Uh, but here's the thing. I, my dislike of the ending has nothing to do with that. <laughs> well, in part it has to do with Sombra's fault, but it has nothing to do with the fact that this is left open-ended. In fact, the, as with real life, where there's life, there's hope. They could always come back to this issue. Mm -hmm. my, gr my grief with the ending is, is, one, it is breaking its own rules uh, about that it established in-universe and... Uh, from a storytelling perspective, that's not good. Uh, the whole point of this comic is that Celestia's traveling back and forth, is having is tying the worlds together so that one what happens at one starts to have an impact on the other. But somehow, now that Sombra gets turned evil, suddenly balance is restored. Uh, what? No, that so, our the Pony universe we know, Sombra is dead. He got blown up. Yeah, he's dead. Which, that is also one of the issues that the comic brings up, is that we, if he's dead, why isn't good Sombra dead as well? Well, because... Why is he still alive? Because, no, it is very clear, because in the comic, in the first issue, you have the main six fighting against evil Celestia and evil Luna, mm -hmm. and as they get hurt, uh, Celestia and Luna in the other universe get hurt. So when Sombra got yeah. blown up on the first universe, why didn't the good Sombra got blown up as well? Well, here's the thing, because... That is, of... that is, that is, that is true. That is one of the things that doesn't get, uh, that, that doesn't well, get... It, answered. It doesn't really need to be answered. It's kind of logical because during oh, the... Oh, it's, it's, it's well, illogical. It, no, okay. It is illogical. Guys, it guys, doesn't guys. make sense. No, no. The, here's the, here's, here's no. the thing, guys. I am agreeing with Silver here. However, that is not a game breaker for me. It's still... Uh, I still like the comic, but I completely agree with what Silver is saying oh, here. But That was making me scratch my okay. head when um, I was reading about it. Let, let's let Norman answer. <laughs> Jerks. No, um, I, I like to overwhelm Norman. Sorry. No, okay. Here's the thing. The spacing and timing between that event and what happens here is a full season away because I'm guessing in the start of season three, right? Oh, no, no. Well, I gotta, I'm sorry, but I have to weigh in here. We've been told that it was the context of the show, one season does not equal one year. No, I mean, yes. what I'm stressed, trying to say is that the timing between this event and the Crystal Empire event, which I'm really forgetting, is it the start of season no. three? Dude, dude, that's totally, it's totally once the end of the Crystal Empire because they mention that Sombra got killed when affected by the Crystal no, I, Heart. I know, I know. And Twilight is an alicorn. Yeah, I, I know. That's what I'm trying to say here. Because from that point in the Crystal Empire, it was way before this event. Oh, no. I don't think it was way before. I, I really... We're kind of assuming a, a time duration here. Yeah, we, can, but... we have to because... Well, you see, from my perspective, all this happened in the span of a year. I, I stick by my my video that we started. This show started with one summer sun celebration, and season four started with one year later. Yeah, which again, that is true. Which again, well, a lot of people have called have 
challenge this, saying, oh, but there were two winters, or, uh, you know, the, the, the timeline is hard to gauge. If we look at the events, this happened before uh, Princess Twilight, because they still have the elements, but she's an alicorn. Yeah, obviously. So this is in between season three and four, probably yeah. after Equestria goes, so... Yeah, because they do mention Equestria Girls and how there was a mirror and yeah. how Spike was a dog in it, and yeah. So now, the magic or the bond between world is not strong. So whatever happens in the show or the world we know doesn't really affect the world in the parallel universe. So the bond well, is not just, strong. Just to date, the, the, uh, our reviews... We are doing this after the Friends Forever issue 11 got released. That was the one with Fluttershy and Iron Will. Mm -hmm. that, was, that, that is the first time that we see the new castle that Twilight has in Ponyville. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's how... That, and that, one, like, that one was released way after, um, way after this arc concluded. So, yeah, that is the, spe the, the speed that the comics have respect the show. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, besides, I think it was uh, Andy Price or Heather Breckel, the one who said this, is that the comics are tier B canon and the show is tier A canon. Mm -hmm. So what happens in the comics doesn't necessarily happen in the show, but what happens in the show definitely affects what happens in the comics. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's true, it's true. So what, what I'm trying to say here, or what my point is, that why the good Sombra didn't blew up as it is, is because of the effect of the merging of the world. It's not that strong. It's kind of meh. What they say here is the same chef from both worlds uh, cooking the same meal. Or when Star Swirl the Bearded borrow one book from Sombra's universe, it disappears in their universe. So it's some minor things like that, but it's not strong enough to murder a character. Yeah, they kill no. the character. Yeah, but it's not ahead, strong enough. Go ahead. Oh. No, no, at, least we go think, ahead at least we think he's dead. I still hope for the day Somber might actually make a return. No, yeah, true, actually, true, true, true. I... Do, something, do something more than growl. Yeah, true. Uh, but the, the events you're describing that they, that they talk about, that was a thousand years ago, and it's implied Celestia has been going on, so the bond should be strengthening over time. And again, we're stuck in speculation mode. At most, at the very, actually, at the very least, I would expect Sombra had a really bad night on the can <laughs> when this happened. Wow. The other thing that doesn't really get uh, completely flexed out, but that, however, it actually makes a lot of sense because it does work, is that as soon as they banish Luna to the moon, the Luna on the other universe, on the other universe she turns good. And so the alternate universe Luna and the alternate universe Sombra, they start working together. And uh, they rule the land together. And when, and, and when Luna is restored, that Luna goes evil. Yeah, mm. that Luna goes evil. And I actually like to think that one of the reasons why Celestia wanted to hang out with uh, the alternate Sombra so much and eventually fell in love with him, it's also because, actually, they, they do bring this up in the comic in a couple of occasions, is because L L Celestia had a chance to... Uh, see her sister. It's, it was not her sister per se, but she was missing her so much. Mm -hmm. It was better than no Luna at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I I do like that idea. Mm, true. In that we we do that. At least, well, I do that as a person. I when my friends are not around or when someone who's uh, who I really want to see is not around, I usually look for the comfort of my other friends because I feel lonely, I feel sad, I feel depressed. Where, is my, where, is, where are my friends? I need my company. And even though it, they are not the person that I'm looking for, uh, they are still my friends and I want to hang out with them. Mm -hmm. I see. We're, we're just substitutes. Yeah. I see how it is. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. of course, of course. Yeah, of course oh. you are. Come on. Oh. Uh, it's like when I lost my when I lost my GI Joes, I was playing with my action, and I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I found a page. I found a page. It's in issue nineteen on page six. It says this: If you're reading this, you may be overthinking this comic book. Oh, and that and that gets into that. probably the the number one reason people got upset at this comic. <laughs> you, oh, you don't... especially brony analysts. <laughs> Special Royas. People don't, it's funny, it is, it's funny, it's self-referential, it's kind of poking fun at the whole insistence on continuity, but fans don't like it when you tell them that. Uh, actually, you're, you're quoting, um, 
the page, I think in the very same panel, mm-hmm. what Inky's dialogue? <laughs> Our world doesn't even make sense. Who need? Why should this one? Who needs continuity? I love it's it. funny. It's funny, and I love the I love the joke. But the reaction I did see online was people were really almost offended by that. You never. Yeah, people were really upset. The, the funny thing is that you never tell your fans not to think. There is a difference between thinking, and there is a difference between oh my god, you don't have any life outside of this, don't you? What some fans of the show and of the comic do is exactly that. They turn their nitpicking radars so high. That it, it makes me wonder, how can you even enjoy this anymore? Mm-hmm. It's like, I literally look at people online and I'm like, um, it's very clear that what you are, it's very clear that you are upset with this, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. you are not clearly enjoying this. Why are you still watching? <laughs> Reasons. <laughs> ah, oh, my ear. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Okay, I he, just he... Get, I, I, it, it grinds my gears when people get, get like that. It's like, yeah. it's, it's, Okay, okay. There are kids shows that are supposed to be very challenging, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that are very smart, that kids are meant to uh, think about it and sit down and like that treats them like intelligent guys, all that. My Little Pony is not necessarily one of those. It's a very simple show. It's not complicated. It doesn't need to be scrutinized. It's something that you sit down, enjoy, watch. It's character driven, and when something is character driven, it doesn't always make sense. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing: like for those people who well got offended by what Pinky said or what Katie Cook wrote, it's they're taking it too seriously. Come on, Pink, <sighs> it's one thing. It's Pinky. Don't overthink it. It's Pinky. Even Rainbow Dash said in the very beginning when Applejack says, "How did she do it?" Don't ask. It's that. It's Pinky. You just don't ask. I'm sorry about the ear deafening uh, retard outbreak, by the way, but I just had to do it. It's, it's. Well, why do you have to be like? Why, why do people have to be like that? I don't get it. I don't understand that. And then that behavior always gets to me in the worst way possible. Yeah. It's... Sorry. But anywho, gents, we are diddy dallying. So James, uh, what do we do next? You see, this review pretty much defines what is uh, what is up with the comic. It has uh, it has a lot of issues. It has a lot of story within itself. It has a lot of elements. Most of them good. Most of them bad. Uh, uh, <laughs> but what it does have, it has a good structure. I will give it that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That yes, almost all of it is told in flashback, but none of the times it feels confusing between the flashbacks and uh, uh, the real time. That's what's going on in the present. I think that we should give it credit uh, for that. Well, and I do like thinking about this show and trying to figure out the rules to magic because, and I and I will insist on this that the whole point, the conflict they set up is the worlds are out of balance. They flat out say that. And that somehow Sombra's fall will restore balance. But by the end, I actually think, well, no, you've actually made it more unbalanced. You've got a world where everything is opposites. But now suddenly Celestia and Luna are good in both worlds. And you've got one bad Sombra and one possibly deceased. So that just seems really out of whack. But everything's fine except for the horrible, tragic end uh, for Sombra. And it's not even an end. Again, where there's life, there's hope. Um, but here's here's the thing, and this is probably my biggest issue with both the comic and the show. And I won't have anyone saying, oh, you're overthinking this, because it's a message to kids. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see. You're draining the evil out of someone. Okay. I have, And we talked about if this is supposed to mimic real life. You can't drain someone of that trait, because it's never that simple. And I really do. And even in uh, entertainment aimed at a young audience, I don't like it when you try to simplify things. I didn't like it when the elements of harmony just turned her good willy nilly. Mm. I didn't like it. I didn't like it when Cadence's love beam made a couple stop fighting rather than let them uh, work it out. Or heaven forbid, she act as a moderator. <laughs> and I don't. And I don't like that uh, Sombra just drains the evil out of them, and suddenly that makes them. Good, well, as if that's just the default. Well, you, that's okay. that's using magic as a shortcut, 
And that's pretty much criminal in storytelling in my eyes. Well, if you really think about it, it's not impossible because in the season four finale, um, Twilight's Kingdom, Princess Celestia, Luna, and Cadence gave their power to Twilight. So I don't see the well, difference here. But, but in, that didn't change her personality. Well, I mean, in, let's, here's my question. Discord in the season two premiere was a villain because he he used his magic to change how um, the characters acted. Mm -hmm. When our heroines do it, it's purification and not brainwashing? Well, when you're talking about uh, evil and all that, you have to talk about... You, you have to specify what kind of evil you're talking about. If you're talking about evil for little kids, evil for children, it is not the same kind of evil as, let's say, Loki from the Avengers, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm talking about the, mo the, the, lock, the, the movie. movie The Avengers, not the comics, because I, I want to keep things simple. Um, Loki is a villain in that movie. He kills, he deceives, he uh, murders, all that. Yeah. And, uh, but he has a reason to do that, because he was exiled, he lost his position, he is uh, hurt, he feels betrayed and all that, so he has a motivation to do that. Uh and it's not a petty motivation. It's actually rather legit. So he's heard about it. He acts like that. However, when we talk about other pop, pop culture villain, and I am going all the way back to the first movie Disney ever made, which is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. When you talk about the, the evil queen, oh, yeah? her motivations couldn't be more petty. <laughs> they couldn't be more uh, 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 ridiculous or like completely superfluous. And the way that she's acting, it's mostly driven entirely by what she wants to get. She wants to just, uh, uh, she wants to kill this girl. Why? Because she's prettier than, than me. And that's it. And how do they get, and what are her, uh, what are her reasons to be like that? Why does she have any hint of good inside her? No, not really, because she's just pure evil. She's just evil, evil, bad, bad, nothing else. That's something Disney has ever has always done, and they they keep doing it, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In that, <laughs> the villain being completely evil and nothing else. <laughs> In this regard, I think that uh, treating evil like it's a mosquito bite, <laughs> and you just suck the poison out of it, um, that that doesn't work when you talk about it on a real life kind of like situation where of course nobody's evil completely mm, true that even 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 dictators have a hint of uh, goodness in them and i'm not going to get any further no, on no, that no. but when you're talking about children when you talk about simplifying things and making it easier for them to understand um perhaps putting evil as something that you can suck out of someone is not the best idea but it's probably a way to represent that Everyone, even the evil people, uh, have uh, the potential to uh, become good. Mm, that, is true. that if you are able to suck the evil out of something, that means there is some good left in them that opens when you take the evil away. So that's at least how I see it. It's, it's more a state of mind. And the, the, like, the same problem with almost every single story driven by emotion, and this comic is driven by that, that is a problem that you're going to encounter. Because sometimes emotionals... No, no, always. Emotions are irrational. Mm -hmm. Emotions by nature, by nature are irrational. They are, not fall, they are not driven by a logic. They cannot be explained. You just sit down and see them. Mm -hmm. That is true. That is true. Well, I, I disagree. I, I, I really hate this representation in fiction that you can just zap someone that... The, stru the choices of good and evil, if, if it always boils down to, oh, I'll just zap you and everything will be fine, then there's no investment. There's nothing sincere about it. Oh, yeah. It feels plot convenience. I can see your point here, Silver, and I can agree to a point. With this, with the MLP story or how it has been running from the beginning till end, there's always been the Deus Ex Machina. Things. And we hate Deus Ex. <laughs> well, they pick it's up. the most criticized literary and storytelling uh, device. It's the one people are always saying, "Oh, don't do Deus Ex, you fool!" Yeah, but but still, but still, um, in the end, yeah, but you, that, that is the other problem is that sometimes you write yourself into a corner and you need to resort to a Deus Ex Machina. Hmm. The biggest flaw 
of this story arc and the biggest flaw of this story is that it's only four issues long. Oh, yeah. And I go back to what I said at the beginning of the comic, they beat off more than they could chew. This, yeah. this issue could have had uh, two more issues. Two more issues could have fixed every single problem and people wouldn't have reacted the way they reacted. But the way they reacted, holy shit! That was... That was... If it wasn't an outrage, if it wasn't people clamoring for refunds, I don't know what it was. It wasn't with the 2014 annual that people wanted to boycott the uh, MLP comics. It's, it started with this one. The comments that I read about Ted, uh, about uh, uh, Andy, Price. Andy Price and uh, uh, Katie Cook, when people were saying, oh, look at that, Katie Cook and Andy Price working together in a comic, that means he's going to suck again like the King Sombra and Princess Celestia one. Oh, well, we're not going to buy it. I'm not going to spend my money on the Applejack and Rarity comic. Screw them. So you know, that's where it started. I think that was, that was, this was the story arc where people are going to start either continue reading the comics or stop reading the comics. I, I can see your point here, and I don't agree with it. Uh, well, I don't agree with the general f- fan base that do that because that's fickle. The thing is, the Katie Cook and Andy Price are a good combo. They work really well together. And for people who have a biased opinion on certain characters, for example, Lou Celestia here, they, they in their mind, already have a set ideology of how this character should work. This also happens in the Cadence and Shining Armor arc, where, oh, how dare you write Cadence this way? Here, read my fanfic and educate yourself. Those are the people who go, who take things to the extreme. Oh Didn't they actually get a comment like that? They did. I'm not even joking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did get a comment. Somebody went at them and said, you should read my fanfic and educate yourself about how to write for these characters. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing. With, with me, with this arc, people don't like it because how dare you give Celestia a boyfriend? No, that won't work because Celestia is coupled with Twilight my Sparkle. OC. <laughs> oh, yeah, Twilight Sparkle or my OC or something like that. She has a relation with her sister. Oh, uh, yeah, no. But For God's sake, uh, guys. Yeah, see, the point I'm trying to make here is with this, it's not even a good boycott reason. With the annual 2014 one, that, that wasn't is... a good boycott reason either. Ooh. That was petty as well. That was petty. Yeah, but I don't uh... agree. Uh, uh, okay, hang on a minute. Before you go any further, mm-hmm. we are getting severely off topic. <laughs> Indeed, and mm. I have the feeling that we are getting very heavy as well. I don't know about you, but I think this is getting really heavy. Mm-hmm. Dude, this is heavy. This but, is heavy. Uh, <laughs> sort of diving into this, uh, trying to go sequentially, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, one. W- it's funny, we talk about character interpretations. Right away, first three pages, it's Luna trying to fill in with Celestia, for Celestia. And, you know, people have this... There's this debate going, which is the real Luna? Uh, people, the Luna in the show is mostly just very composed, very stern. Ironically, one of the least experienced princesses is the one most insisting on tradition and form. And But you get to the comics, and it's her... Being loud, uh, being silly. hyper, silly, and I'll be honest, in terms of entertainment, I like the comic Luna a lot more. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it's fun just to see her trying to fill in with a pink Celestia with the most frightening grin I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been difficult. <laughs> Raising the sun. Uh-oh. I wonder, did she even sleep? Oh, God. I'm guessing yes, because she's... <laughs> She has, like, she only stay up until... Uh, she just only stay up just to raise the sun. I said, but yeah, I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing the owl bears of Equestria had a little bit of a reprieve from her. <laughs> My God, poor Luna. Yeah. No. But, yeah, in terms of entertainment value, I will agree with Silver. She is a lot more entertaining in the comics. Mm. Uh, but I like how dignified and uh, uh, sure of herself is uh, she is in the, in the show. Mm. Like, uh, I'm not... I'm not going to I'm not going to joke here guys but whenever I watch Sleepless in Ponyville and Luna appears in Scootaloo's dream I get all giddy. Yeah. It, it's it's like <laughs> it feels it feels great because she is such a, a she has a lot of uh, 
dignity mm -hmm. to her. Mm -hmm. And she carries her herself with a lot of dignity. While in the comics, she allows herself to be more of a goofball. But you, you, and right? that's, that's fun as well. I totally... I, 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 I like both Lunas, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if you twist my arm and you and you hurt me a lot and you torture me <laughs> in your chamber and all that, I'll have to go with the, with the show one. However, really? I like both Lunas a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like, like the dignified really? Luna. I like, yeah, the... I like the... Sorry. I, well, I like the dignified Luna because she reminds me a lot of Galadriel from Lord of the Rings, <laughs> so I, I cannot help it. I, I'm, anything, I'm that with... reminds me of, anything that reminds me of Kate Blanchett has a... Good points on my on my book, so I'm sorry I cannot help it. I'm with Silver here. I I like the comic book better, but we, in my mindset, in my mindset, is something like this. In the show, she has a responsibility. She has to be serious at that moment. In the comic, she's herself. She lets loose. We haven't seen Luna outside in her intimacy. Now that I think about it, in the show. Well, in the comic, we have. No, well, we just have to wait and see. We just have to wait and see. But you you know. I think we're past. We gone past beyond the point of return. We are <laughs> we all over. We're not discussing the comic anymore. We are discussing individual characters. I, I think we well, are, we already said what we thought about the comic. I like it. Silver is just in between. You like it, James. So overall, yeah, I really like it a lot. Yeah, like overall, it. we're just talking about what we like and discussing the things we like and what we don't like and discussing the things we don't like. I think this is. Yeah, <laughs> I, I well, like it. It's a, it's a like I said, this comic is just stuck to the brim, and it's hard to really tackle it sequentially because all this stuff are sort of themes throughout the comic. Mm, true. Uh, true. One, one thing we haven't really talked about is Twilight, and mm. how she has sort of a meltdown when she realizes that she's in the shadow of two of the biggest ponies in history, mm, true, Celestia true. the Ruler and and Star Swirl, who pretty much has done everything in the past. I'm starting to wonder if any pony else did anything ever. <laughs> yeah, like if there were other inventors or other discoverers while Starosel apparently discovered everything. No, no, I, I think how this goes is they didn't have coffee in their universe, so they took some from the parallel universe and brought it home just to make some, so you got coffee, so yay, Starbucks. What if, what if... The this un this universe's Pinky is actually from the other universe, and she's like that because she had a lot of coffee when she grew up. <laughs> I don't know, but it's you see, you can go so many places. This yeah. arc gives you all that much. Mm. I think that is one of the richness of the comic that of this arc that uh, nobody can deny mm -hmm. is that it opens up a lot of discussion and it, it opens oh, yes. up a lot of yeah, it, a lot of talking. This, this always happens when parallel universe comes into play when the discovery of Another universe is out there. You can do multiple things. That's always been the topic of debate. Like, what would happen? Do you sorry, do you think that a universe with X is available or Y is here or something like that? It's always that kind of thing. And moving back to the comic and the characters, the other world's Luna design I really love because it has a Greek design, which is really cool. I like yeah. Although Celestia is Egyptian when she's yeah. freed. Well, it's, I was like, Egyptian? Yeah. Huh? I, I well, know. Okay. Then again, when you look at the Pegasi culture, they have a mix between Roman and Greek as well. Mm -hmm. So it balances out both of them. Oh. However, it was it was rather weird because at least with Roman and Greek, it kind of makes sense because it all takes place in Europe. Egyptian and Greek, that is very odd, but well, to me, it, it kind of works. We have to think about it in the sense of... well. I, I, maybe you're overthinking it again, but I'm just thinking like Egyptian. They have a sun god, right? So why yeah. not? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I just got it. And then like true. Greek, they have a moon goddess or something, right? I I'm not sure. So they're just using that as reference, probably. I don't know. So uh, Who knows what I just like. Oh, fly like an Egyptian. <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, God. You're reminding, of, you're reminding me of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Yay. <laughs> Uh, but uh, sorry, go ahead. But, uh, w but with Twilight, I mean, she's finally. I've been hungry to see her tackling the question of what am I supposed to do. You know, we had that. Oh, we'll talk about that later. Well, it's later. <laughs> and now they don't give a firm answer, and I like that because this isn't a. Uh, you know, oh, you you found out Celestia's flaw, therefore everything's okay. Mm -hmm. Twilight's learning a little bit of flexibility in this. I but. Yeah, I still 
look forward to the day when Twilight might get to lead ponies other than the main six, <laughs> either in the comic or in the show. You know, I, I I like to think that this comic event happens somewhere around after Princess Twilight Sparkle. And but it the, can't. Yeah, what do you mean? It, it can't happen after Princess Twilight Sparkle because they, they still have the elements. Oh, yeah. That, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Then, again, then again, remember, continuity of the show doesn't equal continuity of the comics. Yeah, However, yeah. what happens in the show affects the comics directly. Mm. You cannot have both of them together. It's, it's, it's impossible. Um, you know how uh, recently Lucasfilm and Disney, they came forth oh, and said, yeah. all the comics in Star Wars, all the video games, all, all of books. that, that is not canon. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess from the very beginning, actually, they are saying that... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm actually glad for that. Yay, Chewbacca lives! <laughs> I am actually rather glad that they're doing it, to be perfectly honest, because I have no idea about the comics, oh, I have yeah. no idea about the video games, and I got, like, completely lost. Yeah, you so, know. Sorry. I, I, I'm pretty sure that, not explicitly, but from the very beginning, they said the comics don't represent the canon of the show. Canon of the show is tier one. Canon of the comics is tier two. No. It's not the same. That's good. You That's good. Don't don't don't, uh, don't apply one and the other. Yeah, That's I mean, not how it goes. That's good because we don't want to create confusion. Like the reason why um, Disney and Lucas Films uh, did the purging of all the not show canon is because that during the time before episode 1 came out people were clamoring for more Star Wars and since they could buy the rights or could rent out the rights for more shows they created more stories involving the characters and as time goes on you'll build up canons and you'll build up stories and without Lucas saying no this doesn't relate to um, the movies canon or whatnot, they spread out. So with what Hasbro's doing, it's pretty ingenious where the show is tier one, meaning whatever happens in the show goes. And with the comics, it's tier two. Whatever happens in the show is canon and whatever whatever happens in the comic stays in the comic. What happens in the show does affect us, but we keep our we play by ourselves. We just borrow our big brother's toys, that's all. I still like the simplicity. I don't like the the fact that they are like. Imagine juggling the comic and the show. Oh, no. Imagine putting all of the things that happen in the arcs in the reflection arc, mm-hmm. uh, in the show. I can imagine children asking their parents about all of these things, Oy, and... and the parents are getting sick of it. Yeah, yeah. I think that more than anything, more than ever, the reflections arc was focused to a more uh, older, uh, to an older audience. It could work a lot better, though. It could have been a lot better. It could have been handled a lot better. But then again, it's it's experimental. I think this is the first time that My Little Pony trades something like this. Remember the original Generation 1 comics? Oh, God, no. Oh, my. Hey, those ponies are freaking hardcore. I've read a few. Yeah. Okay, you, you've got... Uh, their, que- their queen turns people to bubbles and boils them away. Applejack killed a guy. Oh, God. And... Re- and restored sight to ponies by sh- by putting jewels in their eyes. Oh God! That, oh, I, the eighties were a lot darker than I remember. But oh, but not no. I don't mean I don't mean uh, I don't mean those comics. I mean the ones where you know the ones that were in the same level as <laughs> the ones that appear on the official pony magazines. <laughs> oh, oh, those. Yeah, those, those. That's the, the, those are that I'm talking about. Now, I do remember those comics actually. The ones that Silver is talking about. I did have one. <laughs> oh God. I think I had the Applejack one. Oh, God. And, like, Fear the G1. <laughs> Jeez. And, and here's the thing that Pinkie Pie says in the comic book that makes it... Well, you can tell that this comic was aimed for us, yet still trying to aim for kids at the same time, is when Evil Celestia sunblasts um, Evil Luna. And Pinkie Pie said this, You can't do that. This is a kid's comic. <laughs> <laughs> Self-referential much, but yes, it's Pinkie Pie. So the pink deal. puffy one keeps breaking the fourth wall. She's going to break through one of these days. Mm-hmm, true. And if you take a look, see at the same page, which is issue twenty, book uh, page twelve, that scene with Celestia's eye glaring at King Sombra, that art style or that draws drawing style is really intimidating and evil. 
Actually, I thought I thought the most intimidating was at the end of the third issue where they're plotting. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh, those oh, my God. Yep, yep. That's all, not not quite Queen Chrysalis levels of creepy, but uh, still. still. And you know, the one thing we haven't really talked about, and I I know it, it, this is stretching out, <laughs> but <laughs> King Sombra himself, the good King Sombra. Mm-hmm. So uh, another complaint when this came up was, you know, oh, you're such a Gary Stew. Not really. I actually, I actually thought, you know, this is clever. Hmm. I, but to draw a strange analogy, I thought of River Song from Doctor Who. I don't know. Yeah, if I, you I, guys, know. I know. Yeah, what? A, a lot of people leveled the same accusation. Oh, she's a Mary Sue character. She's until I watched a review by SF Debris. Mm-hmm. who was covering a few Doctor Who episodes. He talked about for River to have the relationship we, she has with the Doctor, won't give away what, she has to be, a, she has to have some sort of unique quality. That So in the sense that the audience can appreciate she's worthy of the Doctor, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that same regards, a good King Sovereign is actually really clever because you don't even need to, watch him in action a lot to know, okay, the Sombra we saw was generically evil. <laughs> and, this, and this Sombra, you can kind of assume he, based on the rules of the universe, it's... he's equal parts good. Mm-hmm. And at first that doesn't make him a terribly interesting character on his own. Mm-hmm. But then you see him interact, and he's kind of fun. He's got the wit. He can handle Celestia spewing coffee on him. <laughs> props there. Yep. But, but my favorite moment is when evil Celestia is saying, you know, oh, just give me the portal to the new world and you can have this one and your your girlfriend. <laughs> and he's this he's smart. He says, I don't believe for one second that you would leave this place so easily and uh, you can't have both worlds. So he's not just, oh, I must do this because I am a goody good Dudley do right. <laughs> he's smart. And he's kind of got he's got eyes open. And yet throughout the entire comic, as uh, he was talking about his love for Celestia and talking to Twilight about what how to be a good pony, and that translates into a good ruler, mm-hmm. I just kept thinking, you're going to die. <laughs> you're gonna this, die. Is a, this is a warning flag. This is what a character does when they're about to die. Uh, I've seen how to train being a good ruler. <laughs> I've seen how to train your dragon, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was thinking about the same thing. <laughs> you're going to die. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't really want you to die, but you're going to die. Sorry. Uh, and uh, not like you. And so, yeah. And so by the end, I was like, "Well, he didn't die." Yay. Per se, yeah. <laughs> it's actually kind of a worse destiny than death. Oh my! It's because you become an evil. Yeah, he becomes evil and all that. But he has <laughs> collection of everything that he has done. Oh, this reminds me of the Batman quote: uh, "You die. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself as a villain." But again, it Don't comes back that. to that whole that whole just filling a guy up with evil. <laughs> what happens to his choice? I mean, that is a heartbreaking final panel. Oh uh, yeah, where he's saying goodbye to Celestia. He's like, well, he's not just evil for evil's sake. Then I mean, he still cares about her. From my head cannon right now, I think that. Oh no, Norman! Don't bring head cannons. No, maybe it, yeah, it's head, a head cannons are treacherous. I know, but the problem. thing is that um, the sombra here is his his mindset or his sanity is slowly going away, and when he says that goodbye, it's kind of slowly weaving away. I still fall back. While it is a terrible fate, I, I once again quote: "Where there's life, there's hope." Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be opposed to them coming back to this world. Uh, getting to explore it a little more. Oh, I, don't without, I, I don't mind. With Alicorn Trixie. Oh, yeah, we forget to mention <laughs> that. We, we forget to mention that. We've been all over the place. But the... that's the thing with this comic, Norman. Don't you see? Is that we also didn't mention the alternate uni- uh, the alternate uh, main six. What? Where are, are they? Like, <laughs> do they even yeah, well, they, didn't, they didn't do anything. <laughs> Because they didn't do anything, but they are there. We didn't mention all the other uh, uh, little Easter eggs. Mm. Like, we see the alternate uh, Doctor and the alternate Derpy. Mm. That's one of the elements of Harmony. We don't we don't talk about uh, alternate Cadence and Shining Armor. Uh, we don't talk about the destroyed statues mm. and the, 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 the place that they arrive. Mm. Or how Celestia and Starswell got arrested in their first visit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how they... Uh, or the things that are in Starswell's library. Oh, yeah. We we didn't talk about uh, 
uh, the, the the moment where both universes collapse and when the mirror gets destroyed, which uh, it begs the question: How are they even gonna come back to this universe when the link between both worlds is gone? Yeah. Uh, there are so many things in this comic, and that was something that I was dreading when uh, when we were going to talk about this re- uh, uh, when we were going to be reviewing this. Mm-hmm. There is no focus. Well, the, and the, that's perhaps the biggest. That, that, the, that's perhaps the biggest problem with the comic in itself is that it feels slightly unfocused at times. Well, it could probably be us, but in in the end, what I feel is that. There's so much to talk about, yet so little time. If we really want to talk about everything that we want in the comics, it's going to take us five hours. And trust me, guys, I I can take five hours out of my life to talk about the comics, but do other people want to? <laughs> how, 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 how long have we been reviewing this? This is probably the longest. Re- no, no. Is it like, what, an hour and a half already? Um. Uh, on call it's two hours, but on record it's about an hour. This is insane. Well, like you say, this thing is chalked to the brim, and you you mentioned you could get two more issues. I think you could get another four part arc out of this, mm-hmm. like a four part arc for just uh, Celestia in the past, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then a four part arc for in the present. And I would love to see more of this alternate world, more than just quick little. Snippets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you know. Hell, you know what? We're talking about arcs and all that. We can make an entire season based on this alone. Mm, true that. We true can make that. an entire season of My Little Pony, twenty-six episodes. The epic Love reflections story. arc. <laughs> it starts. The first episode starts with Celestia disappearing and the main six opening the library, and the second episode is Celestia coming back and she's all injured. And that's where things just like, oh god, what's going on? What's going to happen? That could be an entire series arc, not just comic book. Hmm. That's that's how much a game you can get out of this. That's true. That's so true. So I, I I can totally understand when people say that it's not completely exploit, that it's not used to its full potential, that there are a lot, a lot of things left to be interpretation, and. I know it's unsatisfying for those who want answers. Oh, Sadly, true. sometimes you cannot get answers for everything. Mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. That is true, that is true. That's life sometimes. Like It's what I said. I, yeah. I stand by what I said. That's life sometimes. You cannot always get an answer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There is always going to be a mystery there to be unraveled. True that, true that. And like Silver says, I would love to see another arc dedicated to this story, then coming back to this. Mm-hmm. You know what? I, I don't mind. I don't mind it. Like, the possibility of them doing a visit for this story again is high, and I don't mind it at all. I I will enjoy it. I would love to see them do a follow-up to this comic. Well, I, I just want to mention that there is a fan comic out there where the good... Queen Chrysalis ah. is trying to figure out how to save uh, Sombra. Hmm. Now, it's a fan comic, so uh, <laughs> you want to talk about not cotton doing it? <laughs> there you go. How is that doing? But, how, is, how is that doing, by the way? Yeah, well, they, they're still rounding up uh, everybody. She's seeking counsel from the wise and learned derpy. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, pulling all that together. Uh, one alternative, and I just find this kind of a funny idea... They could even do just a spin-off comic. You don't have to have the main six go back. Just mm. have a tale in the alternate world. Why not? I do agree. I, I I want to see that. But the possibility of them doing it is really slim. If they can make comics on Equestria Girls, anything is possible. Yeah. Maybe the next maybe the next annual. Yeah, probably. But an official comic by IDW, the chances are really slim. You know what, guys? I mentioned this on the show, the main show, actually, that Hasbro is working with AllSpark Productions to create a My Little Pony movie in 2017. So I would really love to see them, well, using the materials that they already have, which is the Reflections arc, as a base for their movie. I think that ties in with the Lucas uh, perspective. Yeah. That if you have to have read the comic to appreciate the movie... You're gonna kill half your audience, yeah. you know, the moms and dads and the brothers and such that that's, got dragged along. That's why the comic should be treated as something like, "Oh, look, need the universe expanding. That's neat. All right, let's watch the sh- let's watch the show. Oh, they didn't make mention to the comic. 
That's perfectly fine. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But hey, I still have it there, and according to the comic, this is valid. However, there's always that part of the audience who are like, why don't they make mention to Sombras and Celestia's love affair? Mm -hmm. Why don't they talk about the one time that Big Macintosh looked for a box of nails? (laughs) There's there's nobody acknowledging the existence of Nightmare Rarity. (laughs) Why are people not going after Queen Chrysalis? Oh my god. They don't have pirates in the show. Why don't they have pirates in the show? <laughs> Actually, that is a legit complaint. Why they don't have pirates in the goddamn show? God damn it. I want more pirates. Anyway. Uh, but any, um, any who... point still stands is that sometimes it's good that the comic doesn't follow the canon of the show. Mm, true that, true that. And you know yeah, what, it'd guys? It's a problem if mm-hmm. it does. And you know what, guys? I think we've been rambling for over an hour now. And oh, yeah. the point of the matter is... We like the comic. I I personally uh, do. I like the comic. I like the comic. You like the comic. Silver is neutral towards uh, negative, which is perfectly fine. Look, guys, you see, it's, it is possible to give your opinion and talk about it in a civil, a civil way mm-hmm. without throwing axes and other pointy objects at each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, at true. least in the review. I'm not sure what I'm going to do when the review recording is over. <laughs> but <laughs> So I, I can't use my axe? I sharpened it and everything. No, I actually no. should run away because you have talons and a beak, and I think you you can just pick my face off. So I, I have to be careful. In some cultures, that's hot. Oh, shut up. <laughs> well, you know, Norman, er- earlier, Norman, you were a little eager talking about torture. <laughs> what the hell? When? I was the one talking about torture, not Norman. Yes, you, you can- <laughs> Oh, right, sorry, not Norman, but uh, <laughs> but you were you were rather eager. I sensed a a little bit of uh, invitation there. I said, anyway, Hi, Mel, Brooks. <laughs> Hi, Mel Brooks, how are you doing? Oh my god, I um, like Mel Brooks movies. True, that, true. That. But anywho, right, sorry, Mel Gibson. Oh. Wow, I, totally different. Oh god, oh, I oh. think you want I'm to torture me. <laughs> ah. I <laughs> Oh, now Thank you're reminding you. me of that one Simpsons episode. Oh, no. It's not Simpsons. It's South Park. Oh, my God. Norman. Wait, no. Is there? No, I thought there... It, it's South Park. There's a Simpsons episode with that thing in mind where Homer rented a hotel room. Huh? No, that's seen? Family Guy. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Family Guy. Oh, okay. And that's the other thing is that there is a Family Guy... Uh, we are talking about Family Guy in a My Little Pony comic <laughs> review. We are not doing this. So, okay, let's okay, end. okay, okay. Anywho, anywho. Yes, let's end this. Let's end this. That's what happens when Andy Price and Katie Cook do a comic. You see what happens? You see what happens? Are you happy with it? Is that what you want? I um, hope you're happy, Andy Price and Katie Cook. You've made us talk about The Simpsons. And Family Guy. And Family Guy. Oh, God. I, I feel dirty. I need a shower. Let's go. Let's, let, let, come on. Let's wrap it up. Let's yeah, wrap o- it up. Overall review. Overall opinion. Overall opinion. Yeah, overall opinion. Uh, alphabetically inverted like before. Mm-hmm. Come on. Silver, Silver first. Well, then I blame I blame Megan McCarthy just because. <laughs> uh, I gotta say, uh, for me, like I say, there's so much in this comic that I, I really do enjoy. Celestia's development, Twilight's uh, addressing her princesshood, Sombra being a, a very likable, if initially generic character. Uh, but I'm afraid it still falls apart primarily because of the issues of the balance between worlds and the question of you know. Morality, even presented to a kid, I'm a big advocate of not. There's simplifying, and then there's dumbing down, and I'm concerned we're going more of the latter. Mm. All right, all right. And as for me, I highly enjoy and highly recommend people reading this comic because the art is good, the writing is sharp, the colors. Well, the colors are awesome. I can't say much about the colors because for all. 20 issues that we reviewed, not including the micros, is awesome. Oh, well, including micros, it's going to be 26. Yes. But anywho, um, I'm, as we move on, um, I do like how, like what Silver says, the doubt that Twilight have about her princesshood, which is kind of short, and also the love story that they're trying to present here, the tragic love story that is. And overall, it's a good read. Jing? Um... And finally, for me, I think this uh, this comic does have a lot of issues, uh, more so than the other comics that we have reviewed in the past. But those issues for me are not a deal breaker. I can still enjoy it without them uh, ruining the experience. Uh, 
uh, for me. I can totally understand why some people may not uh, be having fun with it because their brains don't allow them to. Believe me, I know what that is. Mm -hmm. I can get like that as well. But I like the story, like the characters, like the character dynamics. I like the fact that we get to know more about Starsul the Bearded. Um, I like that it doesn't give you answer for everything. It, it leaves you to interpret it, to interpret many things, um, especially if you throw your own twist of imagination into it. Uh, you can get a lot of fun with it as well. At least I do. Mm -hmm. And I also really like uh, how ambitious it is and how uh, how it tries to do something really epic, really big. And it could have been flawless if it had a few more issues if it had a few, uh, uh, a little bit more time to talk about these issues and these um, these themes that are important mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for a very good, very well told dramatic uh, story, mm -hmm. but that fall apart due to time constraint and the limitations of the media. Sometimes comics are not the best tool to tell a story that is limited to like four issues, well, depending on the now, series. There are there are X Men stories that have way less simpler uh, uh, plots that are told in like twenty issues or more. So true, 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 true. But overall, I really like it. I'm very happy that I got my hands on it, and uh, I definitely cannot wait to see more of Andy Price and Katie. Mm -hmm. Ooh, fun fact, guys! If you notice Star Soul in the comic, you do not see his cutie mark, and there's a reason why for this. According to Andy Price, he said that when he drew Star Soul's cutie mark, Hasbro told him to cut it out. Why? Considering that his his cutie mark is on, uh, I believe, dog tags, the officially released dog tags, mm -hmm. the Star Swirl poster from uh, uh, Three's a Crowd, we know his cutie mark. We know his special talent. Mm -hmm. I refuse to be joked about that I've been looking at his flank the whole time, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, if you if you notice every scene with Star Swirl without the cape, and any point we can see his plot, uh, no pun intended, uh, oh, God. it's always the plot heavy. <laughs> indeed, it always has a heavy shadow, which is really black. So the possibility of it being there originally was there, but Andy Price had to black it out with shadows just because Hasbro didn't say one too. But you know, it's. Not a big issue, it's just a fun fact. But okay, so that's it for today's review that I'm pretty sure we're going to continue once the recording is over oh, because probably. it's a, it's a favorite conversation topic of, of mine and Norman. Mm -hmm. Just talk about this one uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that will be for today's review. Next week you will have uh, uh, a review of the QT Mark Crusaders Micro. <laughs> Actually, coming from the same team that did the micro of Pinkie Pie. Mm -hmm. Same writer, same artist. So, uh, yeah, we're going to wrap it up, and that will be the end of the review. Finally. We, I have no idea. We, we started recording, like, last year, right, guys? Well, it's probably. Like, uh, my gosh. Time, time looped, and, like, we are now back at the beginning. <laughs> All right. So This that's is work, and time is valuable. Oh, true that. <laughs> We're going backwards. Oh, this has been James Cork. And I am Norman Sanzo. Me, I'm not this auto silver quill. <laughs> ah, you were lying to us the whole time. Oh my god. Norman, get the net. Yay, get the net. We're gonna have chicken stew tonight. Mm. <laughs> have a good one, everybody. Uh, adios. Adios. Adios.